Bill Maher delivered a brutal 10-minute smackdown of Justin Trudeau's Canada as he burns away the myth of Canada as a progressive and woke paradise. Armed with stats and common sense, Maher torched Trudeau for tanking Canada into an unaffordable woke mess lurching from crisis to crisis, whether it be the economic crisis leading to unemployment or a health crisis plaguing all Canadians, Marr didn't leave much to save face. His ruthless mockery and declaration how Canada is a cautionary tale for every nation should make every Canadian cringe in embarrassment and look to change things for the better. This is Canada's rock-bottom moment, a classic liberal comedian verbally demolishing Trudeau's progressive fantasy land. So what are honest and hard-working Canadians prepared to do about it? Welcome back to Street Politics Canada. Before we start today's video, take a quick second to subscribe to our US-based channel, Street Politics USA, where we report daily uncensored US news and how the unfolding political landscape can impact Canada. You can find the link in the description below. Trudeau has driven Canada to the lowest of lows when it comes to every possible aspect, so much so that it has become a tradition for Canada to be humiliated on the world stage with every powerful global nation laughing at the dire state that Canadians are in under the leadership of the Liberals and Justin Trudeau. The latest round of shame and public humiliation comes from Bill Maher who took almost 10 minutes of his show's time to present the woes of today's Canada as a cautionary tale under the unchecked leadership of Trudeau and the corrupt liberal elites. American comedian Bill Maher delivered a scathing takedown of Canada's embarrassing state, skewering the myth that America's northern neighbor is a progressive and woke paradise. His brutally honest remarks exposed the growing dysfunction plaguing Canada under Justin Trudeau's leadership. Maher's biting criticism should embarrass not just Trudeau, but should in fact embarrass all Canadians into doing the right thing and booting the Liberals out of office once and for all. For too long, American Liberals have held up Canada as an idyllic role model, a place of tolerance, generosity, and enlightened government. Marr shattered that phony image highlighting Canada's ballooning debt, rising unemployment, healthcare crisis, and out-of-control woke ideology run amok under Trudeau's nose. Marr rightly pointed out that Canada is no longer the liberal utopia of old, with runaway immigration straining public services, unaffordable housing, and an economy buckling under massive government spending, Canada increasingly resembles a failed socialist state. Our vaunted public services are crumbling thanks to an increasingly strained tax base and ideological mismanagement. Marr then continued making light gestures about the state of Canada, while highlighting various issues plaguing the country and how warning signs are blaring all over, while Trudeau is silent about fixing any of the mess he has created. Canada is now seen as a cautionary tale for other countries to avoid the extreme left and keep any liberals in check. It is just deeply unfortunate that Canada has now become an example and a case study instead of learning from another nation and avoiding this liberal disaster altogether. Bill Maher then proceeded to take the time to further highlight the issue with excessive and unchecked immigration that the liberals and Trudeau support unequivocally. He talks about how the issues will keep rising until the people are fed and will look for someone else to fix the problems for them someone with some common sense. Kamuz to Mar for boldly puncturing the grand illusions Canadians maintain about ourselves. We are not the open, tolerant, fiscally responsible society of old. Runaway wokeness and government overreach have damaged Canada under Trudeau's leadership. Coming from a self-proclaimed liberal, Mar's words make too much sense in contrast with Trudeau's liberal and corrupt policies. Mar stated how liberals have always been seen as the gas pedal while conservative are often rightfully seen as the brakes, but he will not support putting pedal to the metal when the car is going to go flying off a cliff. A perfect analogy for what Canadians feel with Trudeau, and what a perfect analogy without data and evidence to back it up. Everything Bill Maher talked about was 100% right and provable by data and some common sense. Every day, hardworking Canadians can simply go about their lives while bearing no mind or effort to highlight the woes of living, and they will be promptly met with the sad reality of our great nation. Let us start with the healthcare issue that Bill Maher highlighted, among others. Canada's vaunted healthcare system is failing patients with new data revealing how dire the state is as we rank dead last in primary care access among 10 high-income nations. Just 86% of Canadian adults now have a regular doctor, down from 93% in 2016. This means a staggering 4 million Canadians lack basic primary care. The data exposes the crumbling state of Canadian healthcare under Justin Trudeau's watch. Despite massive and wasteful, as we have come to expect from the Liberals, spending healthcare delivery is worsening with longer wait times, doctor shortages, and lack of access. Other nations are outperforming Canada by wide margins. The Netherlands achieved 99% primary care access in 2023. Even the American private care model fared better at 87%. Canadians now struggle to get appointments with just 26% able to secure same or next-day access, 
versus 46% in 2016. This strains emergency rooms as patients seek care. The impacts are real. Nearly 40% of Canadians without a family doctor have a chronic condition and 29% take prescription medications. Denied proper care, their health will predictably worsen. Low-income Canadians suffer most with less access to doctors. The system fails those who need it most while the affluent can access private options. This unequal, two-tier outcome is the inevitable result of cramped government monopolies. Long wait times for tests, specialists, and procedures further degrade Canadian healthcare. Patients endure agonizing delays for essential diagnostics and treatment. Many turn to foreign hospitals paying out of pocket for timely care. Canada now badly trails its peers in healthcare. We spend more per capita but achieve worse results due to mismanagement and strained capacity from excessive demand. Resources are spread too thin as the system verges on collapse. All of this, and we are not even touching upon the disastrous Safer Supply program that has Canadians smoking meth as a way to somehow magically curb addiction. But the stupidity and the incompetence, sprinkled with some overt and wasteful spending, does not end with Canadian healthcare, because housing is an issue that will stay with Canadians for a while to come, and it is all because of Trudeau and the Liberals' immigration policies. Bill Maher touched upon this issue as a thorn in the side of Canada, and how Trudeau's way of handling it should be a cautionary tale for other nations looking for immigration as a temporary solution. For years, Canadians have urged Trudeau and the Liberals to pump the brakes on the increased immigration that will surely mess with our way of living and our economy and now Canadians are the ones left to foot all the misery that comes from such a rash and uncalculated decision by Trudeau. He almost came close one time to fully admitting and taking responsibility for the excessive immigration policies during a conference on housing where he was heckled to hell and back. Um, there, there, it's really important to understand the context around immigration. Every year we bring in about 450, now close to 500,000 permanent residents a year. And that is uh, part of the necessary growth of Canada. It benefits our, our, uh, our citizens, our communities, it benefits our economy. That, these are the levels that we have stabilized and, and grown steadily over the past years because that's what Canada needs to continue to have a strong economy and strong communities. However, over the past few years, we've seen a massive spike in temporary immigration, whether it's temporary foreign workers uh, or uh, whether it's international students in particular that have uh, grown at a rate far beyond uh, what uh, Canada has uh, been able to absorb. Uh, to give an example, in 2017, percent of Canada's population was made up by of temporary immigrants. Now, we're at seven and a half percent of our population comprised of temporary immigrants. That's something uh, that we need to get back under control, both for the benefits of, uh, of those people, but uh, as international students, we're seeing uh, increasingly vulnerable to mental health challenges, to not being able to, uh, uh, to thrive and get the education they want, but also uh, increasingly more and more businesses uh, relying on temporary foreign workers in a way that's driving down wages in some sectors. So we want to get those numbers down. It's a responsible approach to immigration that continues on our permanent residence as we have, but holds uh, holds the line uh, a little more on the temporary immigration that has caused so much pressure in our communities. But even after acknowledging the harm caused, he remains stubbornly committed to bringing in record numbers of new immigrants. Trudeau conceded his flood-the-zone approach has driven down wages in some sectors by allowing businesses to exploit temporary foreign workers. He also linked surging immigration to the housing crisis pricing Canadians out of the market. He would think he would finally address immigration as a leading and root cause for the housing crisis, but you would be putting the wrong amount of trust into the wrong individual. Trudeau insists on continuing mass immigration at a pace beyond what Canada can reasonably absorb. He still claims 450,000 to 500,000 new permanent residents per year benefits our citizens, an assertion thoroughly contradicted by lived experiences of young Canadians. With immigration fueled population growth outpacing housing supply, home prices have skyrocketed out of reach for most young workers. Trudeau's immigration policies directly contribute to this generational injustice. Likewise, an oversupply of labor enabled by loose immigration depresses wages and job prospects for young people entering the workforce. Business interests profit from cheap foreign workers while young Canadians pay the price. And this where unemployment rises and affordability continues to be nothing but a frivolous dream. Instead of addressing core issues and making it easier for everyone else, Trudeau, 
instead chooses to just keep spending taxpayers' money without a second thought on housing plans and programs that have failed since he assumed leadership back in 2015. It used to be that the deal was, if you worked hard at a good job, you could afford a home. That doesn't seem the case anymore. Younger generations are worried that they won't have a life that looks like how they grew up, like what their parents and grandparents had. Well, that's not fair. So we've been stepping up, putting in the work, talking to Canadians, talking to housing experts, talking to builders, so that we could bring the right solutions that meet the moment. So today, we are releasing the most comprehensive and ambitious housing plan ever seen in Canada. It It builds on the sizable investments we've made over the years, and it goes a lot further. It's a plan to build housing, including for renters, on a scale not seen in generations. We're talking about almost 3.9 million homes by 2031. Whoa. It's a plan that, at its heart, is a commitment to affordability. Our goal is that no Canadian pays more than 30% of their income towards their home. It's also a plan to make sure that we don't leave the most vulnerable behind, that we keep building housing for people with low incomes, and that we take action to address homelessness so people never have to resort to living in a tent. And it's a Team Canada approach that provides incentives for provinces, territories, builders, and nonprofits to come on board. The math is simple. If we can increase housing supply, we can bring down prices. And we're going to need the know-how, abilities, and determination of workers like the ones here behind me today. This is a Liberal government that does not care where this excessive spending will lead Canadians. Even when asked about the possible consequences of a budget deficit, Deputy Prime Minister Christia Freeland opts to lie and paint a rosy picture about Canada's economy and how good they will be holding up. Uh, good morning, Minister Freeland. Sarah Sears from CBC. Good to see you on this rainy day. Yes, good to see you too, Sarah. Thank you for being here. I hope you're not getting too wet. Of course not. Um, look, your government has pledged a lot of new spending announcements in recent days ahead of the budget. You know, what does this mean for the deficit? And what does this mean for fiscal you know, restraint from your government? Will we see the deficit grow? No. I'm happy to I'm happy to give a longer answer to you. So um, when we first formed government in 2015, we were elected on a commitment to make the necessary investments in Canada and Canadians and to do it in a fiscally responsible way. That continues to be our approach today. Uh, we recognize that Canada today needs our government to invest. We need to invest urgently in housing. We need to get more homes built faster, and that requires the federal government to step up, and we are. You know, I had a great conversation, a very nice cup of coffee with Mark and Caitlin, and they have a beautiful house. They have lots of friends and peers who haven't been able to afford their own home, but want to. And it is our government's job to work collaboratively with provinces, territories, municipalities, private sector, public sector to get those homes built. That requires investments and we are going to be there. We are there to make those investments. We also absolutely recognize the importance of acting in a fiscally responsible way within a fiscally responsible framework. Canada today has the lowest debt and the lowest deficit in the G7. We have a AAA rating, which has been repeatedly reaffirmed. And in the fall economic statement, we published some specific fiscal guideposts um, that we said would guide our public finances going forward. We are committed to adhering to those guideposts. And as a follow, where is this new revenue coming from and are we going to see new taxes like a wealth tax in the budget? Et uh, en français s'il vous plaît. Bien sûr. En anglais, très bien. Okay, okay, okay. J'ai compris. Alors, um, so, 
Uh, as I said, um, we recognize there is an urgent need for investments in Canada, and we are going to make those investments. To do otherwise would be simply irresponsible. We also recognize how important it is to act in a fiscally responsible way. When we formed government in 2015, our credo was supporting the middle class and those working hard to join it. And in fact, we were elected on a commitment to ask those at the top to pay a little bit more so that we could provide a tax cut to the middle class. And we did just that. I want to assure Canadians that our belief is we need to invest in middle class Canadians, support middle class Canadians, and we will not be raising taxes on the middle class. Which is ironic considering her comment on Canada's triple A credit rating is at risk according to an RBC report. As RBC warns, a downgrade would hit Canadians directly through higher interest rates on mortgages, loans, and credit cards. Households already struggling with unaffordable housing and record debt will have to endure even more financial pressure. The upcoming Liberal budget promises even more lavish new spending rather than restraint. Trudeau seems unable to control his tax and spend addictions despite the risks. This is how great nations quickly lose their financial footing. And this is exactly how Canada might never escape the clown role on the world stage. Canadians can listen to people like Bill Maher and conservative leaders like Pierre Polyev, or they can choose to continue supporting a liberal government that is only in it for themselves. Well, that's all for now. Do you think Canada has a chance to change its global image? Or is Canada doomed to be the laughing stock of first world nations? Let us know what you think in the comments below. Also, kindly subscribe and leave a like for this video and our other videos because they go a long way in helping our latest content rank. Follow us on our new Twitter account, where we post stuff we can't post on YouTube. You can find the link in the description below. Thanks again for your support, and we'll see you in the next one.